Our speaker today is Mr. Don Roberts. Uh, it's been a ple- pleasure um, to welcome Don uh, to Edmonton. He arrived late yesterday evening. Uh, we we'll spent a little bit of time with him over lunch uh, today and early, early this afternoon. Uh, it's a pleasure to have, have him here. Don has a bachelor's degree in agricultural economics from the University of British Columbia. His master's degree in forest economics from the University of California from Berkeley and an MBA from the University of Chicago. He's got quite a, a, an extensive uh, uh, background. Uh, he's vice, currently vice chairman of Wholesale Banking and managing director in investment banking with uh, CIBC World Markets Incorporated, as was just shown on the slide. Uh, Don is responsible for many of the bank's activities across uh, renewable energy and clean technology sectors. He also provides senior coverage for companies in the global forest products and agriculture industry. Don is currently an adjunct professor um, at UBC in the Department of Forest Resource Management. Uh, He also serves on the board of directors uh, for the Rights and Resources Institute out of Washington, D.C., and serves in advisory capacity uh, for numerous uh, government, industry, and NGO groups. Uh, Something that uh, Don was recently uh, recognized by Corporate Knights magazine as the individual in the financial services sector who has contributed the most to sustainable development and clean capitalism in Canada. This afternoon... Don's going to talk to us about global competition for land. I think this topic is very relevant uh, to the utilization and management of the world's forests, and, and from what I, I see that Don's going to talk about, I think he's going to give us a, a very broaden our perspective on, on land use and, uh, and competition issues. And I'd like to please join me in welcoming uh, Don to the podium. Thank you very much, Bill. Um, I'll, I'll start by, first of all, apologizing to my attire. I was on a, a, a field visit yesterday, and I wrapped up in hall after and didn't get a chance to get back to my home to change my uniform. So, in any case, if, if any crowd is going to be accommodating that, I think it's a forestry crowd, but hopefully that'll be true. Um, so the topics, I, I find too, the little from what was initially um, uh, publicized, and it, it's the convergence of the three Fs, not four, I'll say three Fs, and the global market for land. What do we mean by the 3S and convergence? It's the convergence of the markets for food, fuel, and fiber. And then what do they have in common? Land. Not just land, productive land. So we'll look at those themes. The outline is as follows. I'm going to start with the context. Then we'll look at the convergence of the 3S. We'll put a little more meat behind it. What exactly do we mean? What kind of empirical support for it? Then we'll look at do a bit of a dive on each of the Fs. We're going to start with investments in the fuel, really bioenergy. The second, we'll look at the global fiber or wood markets. Then we'll look at specifically the emergency of energy crops, dedicated energy crops. Then I'm going to pull that all together and look at the markets for land and what these mean for us. And then I'll just put in some concluding remarks. So that's the game plan. When I look at this one, I tend to be overambitious when I look at putting these together. Um, this is, in fact, probably enough content for five lectures. Um, but I talk really fast. And, and I'm going to skip over numbers. But it's not a bad reference, I, I think you may find. So in the context, well, there's the big picture issues. And certainly the population is the biggest. You know, we just hit 7 billion um, earlier this year. And, you know, we're going to increase another 33% between now and 2050. You know, to be 9 billion. So, big changes in it, and two things in terms of the footprint, over 85% of that is going to be outside the developed world. So, it's changes in, in where it is at. And when you look at that kind of population changes, and then you say, well, yes, but we've got to fix the amount of land here. Let's look at the per capita land we've got, and it's falling rapidly. You know, right now we're just below sort of two hectares per capita, and it's going to probably drop another 25% between now and 2050. Some change the amount of land in the arable, but a lot of it is just the population. So, shrinking world, and then the energy side. You know, again, between now and 2050, we're looking at probably a tripling of the amount of energy used. That's a lot. And where are we going to get there? What's its form? Where is it going to be? If you look at the food side, well, I'll pull it in a little. I won't talk 2050. You know, here's some numbers about through 2030. But we're essentially looking at about a 50% increase in food demand and meat 
which is really land intensive, 85%. Crop yields, and that's one of the issues, is that we have seen a slowdown in terms of those improvements. Not everywhere, but we are seeing it in some areas, and that certainly is a source of anxiety. And I think what triggered that anxiety, always, you know, we're pretty myopic, all of us, and then what triggered it last time was that real spike in our weight. And, and, and that caused a, a real spike in food prices and a surge in the demand for farmland that I'm going to document. So that's the context. Let's look at this convergence notion. And convergence, in what sense? In the sense that the market for food, fuel, and fiber if they're going to converge in the sense that the feedstocks that go into them are going to tr start trading over time on the basis of their energy equivalency. And that what we're going to see, really, is probably oil prices being a floor on the prices of lower quality cereals, oil seeds, and lower quality wood. We're already seeing this to some extent. Um, for example, back in August of last year, we saw our first financial swap between oil-based petroleum and rate fuel. So financial folks actually get a financial swap between those two. So this is happening in real time, this convergence. And one of the ways to look at this convergence is, is look at prices, because prices are quite interesting. They summarize information, a lot of it. And so we looked at the prices over time here, from essentially 2000 up to now, for a series of commodities, whether it's, yellow never showed up here, but that's corn. We saw ethanol, crude oil, palm oil, and then roundwood. In this case, I used um, roundwood from Brazil. And then a couple of things that come out of this. First of all, is, is that you see most of there is a correlation here. We all had a steady uptrend. Then we saw the 08 recession, all of them go, and then we started to see them come up. This shows that there is some correlation. It doesn't prove causation, though. It doesn't prove causation. But it shows that there's something going on, they're moving together. Now, there's been a cottage industry of studies that have tried to look at this interaction, especially between the link between bioenergy and food prices. And a lot of them, quite frankly, weren't very good. But there's one in particular that the review of the literature I think was one of the more comprehensive and rigorous, and it came out of the YASA, the think tank out of um, Luxembourg and Austria. And essentially what they did is they looked at this relationship between food and, and bioenergy, and they took as a base case 2008. That was your level of bioenergy demand. And then they said, let's look out, do some what-if scenarios, and said, what if we actually implement all of these quite aggressive bioenergy targets that various countries are putting up. So what if we actually follow through on that? What does it mean for cost to price? And, and they have a, an interesting result. Is they essentially said, if we follow through, we're looking at as much as a 30% higher price for these food crops than in the base case. So I guess it matters. Maybe it's partly because some of these bioenergy targets are really aggressive. There's also a message that comes out of this. One is, is that there's going to be a series of market responses to this policy shock. And that three of the key ones, the policy shock being the aggressive bioenergy target, but there's three in particular market responses. The first is, as I've mentioned, the upward pressure on cost prices. But markets, again, respond to prices. We can also expect to really stimulate the production of traditional agricultural crops to energy crops. And third, this is going to put upward pressure on the demand for the better quality pasture land and timber. They're not going to, for example, interested in converting all timberland. Quite frankly, they don't want it. It's not good enough. But it would be especially the higher quality they're interested in. So that looks at the convergence piece. You can really put some meat around what I was thinking about when we talk about that. Now let's look at, do a bit of a dive here on each of these segments. We're going to start again with the fuel. And I'm going to look at what's the empirical story in terms of bioenergy investment and what drives it. There's four things that drive bioenergy investment. The first one is the delivered cost of the biomass. And that's typically 50 to 70% of your variable cost. So it's that delivered cost of biomass. That drives whether people put money into this sector. The second is the conversion technology. Boy, is it dramatic. It's dramatic. And that's something that we're going to talk about because the offers we had even three years ago are different where they are now. And that's exciting. The third thing that drives whether you put money, actually write a check for bioenergy, is the price of fossil fuels. The number one constraint on renewable energy in Canada is what? Low price of natural gas. That's it. Fortunately, natural gas is geographic. It's not the same everywhere, but it's 
The fourth variable that drives this investment in bioenergy is public policy. It really does. Because a lot of this stuff, quite frankly, on the bioenergy side, wouldn't take place without some kind of government intervention. Partly because of the price signal. But the nature of that policy is changing. We see different mechanisms being used around the world. So that matters. Now, I would argue that for those four variables, given the trends, that actually the outlook long term for investing in bioenergy is probably looking pretty good over time. That's what drives it. Before we get into what are the actual the flows of money going into this, it's important to get the nomenclature right. First of all, what do we mean by bioenergy? There's two big buckets. The first one is biofuels. These are the liquids. The second is the biomass phase. Biomass is the solids and the gas forms. That's where the two sort of technologies sort of take us from different physical forms. And historically, it's really been the investment in the biofuels that's really driven the segment. That's changing. And it's since not 2009, in fact, it's been the biomass base, which has been more dominant. So, how much are we seeing? This looks at, on the left, the pie chart, all the global investments in biomass plants around the world. This is the biomass, the solids and the gases. It's mostly solid from 05 to 2010. And what you see come out of this is essentially about 10 billion a year coming into the sector. Well, that's a lot. And it's been quite stable, despite the biggest global recessions in 70 years. It's really steady. What do you read in there? Public policy. That's one of the things. The other thing is, where is it occurring? Number one, China, 24%. Second, India at 12, UK at 9, US at 8. In Canada, we're sort of below 2%. We're not a big part. Um, now, what's interesting is, Okay, well, that's fine. That took us up to 2010. How about going forward? Given the public policies, where's the money coming in? First of all, China. They're looking at essentially going from 2010, about 6 gigawatts of biomass-based power, to 24 gigawatts by 2020. Cost, what, $70 billion. Now, one of the nasty things about the Chinese is when they put up targets, they tend to meet the targets. So, yeah, I think they're probably going to do that. The second Europe area is Europe. The EU, they expect to double their biomass capacity by 2020, essentially taking it from 13 to 26 gigawatts. Cost, 50 billion. Now, will they follow through? No, let me get this straight. This is the same place that has Greece, Spain, Italy. Mm, probably not. But they've got targets, and they may follow through. We'll see. The third is Brazil. Brazil is fascinating in this area right now because they've got it in its trigger. Quite an increase, probably going to put 55 billion over the next uh, 10 or so years in both in the power as well as the cellulose ethanol. And you would drive it, fuck, we would. But what it is, they've got a regulation, essentially, they're phasing out, essentially, manual harvesting of the sugar. It's all going to be mechanized. It's mechanized, they're going to bring all that extra biomass. As they're doing it, it's going to be at the gate. They're going to start using that stuff. That's the form it's going to be in the first. Bottom line is, Lots of investment going to come in on the solid, on the biomass side. Now, let's look at the fuel side. This has been what traditionally been the food and fuel debate about, right? This is the corn out of the state, this is the sugar cane out of Brazil. And they really did invest a lot. We had, you know, flirting with just over 20, about $23 billion in 07. But boy, has it come down. I mean, we're below $5 billion now. Dramatic reduction. So, changes. And where was that occurring? Well, Roughly 37% in the state, and then 25% in Brazil. Those are the two big dogs who did it. Okay. Well, that was the biofuels, but this was sort of the stuff that we're not really interested in, right? We're tree guys. This was out of the food folks. This is the corn and the sugar cane. So let's look at the non-food fuel. Okay, not the biomass, the fuel, the liquid stuff. What's going on here? And well, what you see is, first of all, it's a lot less. Um, it was about $2 billion in 08 and then crashed. And about 260 billion now, um, we're about one tenth of, of where we were. And who's doing it? The U.S. dominates. Absolutely dominates, 55% of it. Then you get down to the next highest at, at China at 7%. So the U.S. has been the real one driving this move for fuels from biomass. That's important because, as a just quick footnote, bioenergy in general is the weak sister of renewables. Why do I say that? It's because a thing called feedstock pressure. 
I don't pay for the sun. I don't pay for the wind. I pay for you to know it's divine. And that's a sweet thing. Now, is there any redeeming feature of biomass? You bet it is. I don't have to do electrons. I don't just have to do it. I can also do it here. I can't do that with the sun either. So I've got something that's unique. So this ability to start looking at the fuel side is really pretty intriguing. Do we expect much changes in this in the future? I do. We really do, and it's coming out of two areas. One is the U.S. and the second out of Brazil. We mentioned a second ago about this Brazilian stuff. They're going to be doing cellulosic ethanol at the back end of the okay. That's what they're going to do. They're all just new biomass. The U.S. is public policy driven. We think. The catalyst lead public policy this is where it comes through. And I sense that it probably will. And specifically what we're talking about here, when we're talking non-food based biofuels, what's going to trigger it in the States is what they call the Renewable Fuel Standards 2. Where, and this is interesting because in general, it's a target essentially to bring on, stimulate the production of next generation biofuels. Um, and one of the things that we most can agree on in the state is that there's absolute gridlock in Washington. They can't agree on anything. Or can you? The one area where we do see some bipartisan support, in fact, is this. And it's not because they want to be green. Think energy security. That's what they're thinking. That's what's driving. So this is a policy which I think does have some chance it's going to be implemented. And if so, it is going to have quite a dramatic impact. Now, essentially what it's essentially is requiring about 21 billion gallons of advanced biofuels by 2022. Now, is that a lot from where we're doing now? Well, last year we did less than 1 billion. So yeah, that's a stretch target. Furthermore, um, about 16 billion of that, in fact, is going to be advanced cellulosic biofuels. And it's not just expecting, say, we're going to have it in 2022. They've got interim targets. So even this, look at 2015, is over five and a half billion gallons. So over five times what we've got now. So this thing is really, that may have some traction. And what's interesting about it, and why I think we're going to see this come true, is because it doesn't require treasury money. That's really important, because what do we know? Governments are broke, right? We know they're broke. Who's going to pay the bill for this? Oil. The refinery. What we're building in here essentially is a broad and sizable market for cellulosic fuels in the States. And to give you some sense for that, what we did is give a breakdown by the potential expenditures on these fuels by all the big oil guys. So you were looking at, by 2022, if this is in forest, ExxonMobil's got to spend just, just below $12 billion. Valero, 11.7, Conco Phelps, 11.4, down to little Sunoco at 4.3. Bottom line is, is that the top refiners have significant requirement here, and they're going to pay for it if that goes through. What I will say, they have the ability to pay for it. So that's going to drive stuff. One of the things throughout this presentation, each of my style, is I'm going to try to make this real by giving you some case studies as well. In the case study, one of the things, if you're going back in on Conical Phillips or on Exxon, I'm going to say, you know, where can we buy all this cellulosic stuff? But there's none out there. What do you want me to do? Well, is there? It's not right now. Could there be? Well, this chart essentially looks at all of the different bioenergy technologies in the pipeline over time. And there's one of them in particular that I'm going to need a case study on. And this came out initially in some of the work that I led for the future biopathway study for the ETHOP. Um, so I'm going to talk about pyrolysis. And this is essentially what it was pyrolysis. Most haven't heard of it. It's where, at least an example I'm going to give you, where in less than two seconds, in the complete absence of oxygen, you transform biomass into liquid. Less than two seconds. You can get a chemical soup. Um, so, what I'll give you is a case study here from a, a Canadian company called Ensign. And you can do this, but the issue is at what cost? And, and here, I'm going to show you the results that suggest that, in fact, with this process and the kind of biomass prices that I think one can secure, that, in fact, you can be cost competitive with conventional hydrocarbon fuels. And you couldn't have said that even three years ago. That's partly because it's not just for Lenson, but how they've been working with majors like Honeywell and UOP. And UOP is a company, a JV partner, who does these technology producers about 70% of the world's gas in. These are the guys who know the business. So what have we got here? So the first question when you look at the cost of any kind of bioenergy, you have to say, what are you assuming on? Delivered price of biomass. That's the first thing you've got to nail on. So what are we looking at here? 
do some sensitivity analysis. So what you've got here on the vertical axis here is the U.S. dollar barrel of oil equivalent price. And on the horizontal is that you've got the cost of this bio oil, pearlicious oil, renewable fuel oil, whatever you want to call it. A different price of biomass. This is at thirty dollars delivered. This is at fifty, and that's at seven. Well, essentially, this suggests that at fifty dollars a U.S. dollar as a dry metric ton, your total cost, including a ten percent return on capital, is about eighty-four dollars a barrel. That's not crazy. And most people say that's probably not my lung run price of oil. Oil, in fact, it's even higher where we are now than we are now. So that suggests we are getting some competitors than we were before. Given the time, I'm not going to go into some full details on how it compares with other sort of forms of biofuel, but bottom line is it is really quite competitive. And I'll just give you one footnote, though. Um, say you're in D.C., you know, or Alberta, you know, what are you talking about? Fifty, seventy dollars 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 Well, one of the neat things about these technologies, and they're not necessarily just you excited, but to get investors excited, is that I can go to other jurisdictions where I don't pay fifty or seventy. For example, you can use this technology to use some 13 different types of biomass. And one of them is after, for example, you've made palm oil and you've got all the fruit bunches left over. You're down in Malaysia and so, so forth. And, and what can you get those fruit bunches for? Not $50, five. I'm not very much. Furthermore, there's about 32 million tons in the form of these empty fruit bunches and fibers that are available that you can actually use. Looking at the amount of, essentially, it's about 41, it's just over 40 bit, um, million barrels of crude oil sitting on the ground in Malaysia. And at current prices, we're talking about revenue of about 3 billion at today's prices. So, this is stuff that you can do inside. Even if you don't do it here, you can do it inside. This is one of the things that's important. When you're thinking about this sector, you can't just think like this. If you do, you're going to be constrained. Okay, that was the fuel. Now let's look at the wood, the fiber path. And we're going to look at the global markets and start with a snapshot. Where are we, for example, on prices, capturing these pulpwood prices delivered in various parts of the world as of the second quarter of this year? And um, a couple of things that come away from this. First of all, it really matters where you are. Bottom end, and in the left, you can say softwood and the right is hard. And I look at pulpwood, it's not a good time for chips. Um, I look at Pulp, because I can use it for pulp, I can use it for oil steel, I can use it for energy. And that's got some sense of suitability. And prices, U.S. sells, well, we're talking an average about 70. Cost, Germany, flirting with 200. Whereas Western Canada, it's here, an average of about 110. Now, but these are averages. The average is really misleading. You can drive a Mack truck to these sort of ranges in some region. Um, you can do better than me, but this gives you some sense that it really matters where you are. And, and whether you are hard softwood here or hardwood, who's the guy who's really the low-cost dog? U.S. South. He's the biggest absolute volume, and it's cheap. Big player. What's also interesting is look at where folks like China are at. That's China here on the hardwood. Especially triple the prices what they are in the low-cost region. Really interesting price signal for them, especially if they had these targets to put in the bio industry. What the signal is, they're going to come to a place near you to get that biomass because they don't have it at home. Okay, let's sort of back up and look at prices over time. Now, this is a snapshot of the point in time. Look at the speed of the evolution. We're looking at average prices of this pulp wood. And what you see here, where the blue is conifer or the, or the, uh, and the green is, uh, is hardwood, what we've seen is an interesting trend. We saw it get down in the recession, but it's already started to come back up. What, and we really expect this trend to continue. You know what's interesting? Right now, if we update this number, right now, despite all the macroeconomic turmoil, global pulpwood prices are among the highest they've ever been. In fact, global sawwood, sawwood prices are the highest, despite the U.S. recession. Right now, they're the highest. So, yes, there's more than demand going on. There's some interesting supply side effects. So, you better scare up the joke. By the way, as a footnote, that's really important to you as forestry. You want to be managing something of value. This just looks at some regional trends. The message here is that Western Canada has had some of the least increases in these other regions. But in the interest of time, I'm not going to focus a whole lot of it, except for to say one thing. On the left is the softwood again. 
And that's Chile, the one in charge. So this was in 2000 to 2011. Chile has had the biggest increase. Western Canada is just one of the bars. In the hardwood, you know who that is? That's Brazil. Interesting thing going on there. You all hear about these South Americans. You can hear that wood grow, right? It's so efficient. Lots of cash flow. But markets work. They work in the sense that when you've got that much cash flow and you've got that, it's capitalizing the value of the land. The land prices are going to be shown in a second. They're really moving up. The second thing that shows here is exchange rate. The fact that he's got currency. You think we've got a problem? Of course not. South America. They've really been hit hard. And so this relative competitive position is quite dynamic and changing. This is a case study I'm going to do, put out, for example, on the land prices. The case study is Uruguay. And what we've looked at is from 20, 2000 to um, end of 09, and a couple of things that we saw here. On this right here is the amount of essentially um, hectares sold and how it's been coming down. And this is the price, what we've seen. And what we've seen is the price of land in Uruguay, bare pine land, has gone five-fold in the last 10 years. Five-fold. Um, we're now to the point where if you include the price of land, the marginal cost of pulp wood in Uruguay is roughly equal to that in Finland. Surprisingly, And it's because of the value of that land. And for investors, one of the first things that I want to do, I, I look at that five-fold increase in Uruguay land prices. My first question is, who's the next Uruguay? I want to get in there first and ride that land price up, right? Well, there's not a lot of Uruguays out there. There's a couple. And the question is, you know, whether it's places like northern and central Brazil, not the south, central Brazil's got a problem. Or is it places like East Africa? And what you see here is, in fact, huge differences in the cost of plantations. I mean, we're talking, you know, 4,500 U.S. a hectare. In Uruguay and about 4,000 in Brazil, about 3,500 in Australia, you're talking less than 1,000 in Tanzania. And you may not want to go to Tanzania, but real cheap. And it's all because of the land price difference. Okay, that's fine. That one we talked about the five. Now let's talk about a new thing. This new thing dedicated energy costs. There's growing it for the energy. And what is this? This is what I would call sort of your um, flywheel of value creation. And essentially looking at how you would look at it if you were a microbiologist with an MBA. And essentially what we're looking at here is essentially putting together your germ plasm and your breeding with your DNA markers from your genomics, focusing on specific traits, and then growing and having a series of new products come out after you're going through your grinding, your food production, your sales and marketing, and new products. And what you're generating here at the middle is intellectual property. That's the incentive. Now, okay, that's the model where people are now starting to think about these energy crops. And our folks in the, who are examples of people getting into this already? Well, Susano is one out of Brazil. You know, they have essentially said that they're going to produce 3 million tons of wood pellets from solid bio, uh, into solid biofuel. And they're focused on eucalyptus. They've not got the rotation. So they're proposing, looking at the rotation for energy, they've got it down to just about three years. Sounds pretty good, doesn't it? Okay. That's not the real threat. Look at what now specialized energy crop guys are doing. Guys who really are the guys who are like the molecular biologists with the cat, with the, the checkbook. What are they doing? Guys like Ceres, they're not focusing on, on, on perennials. They're focusing on more annuals. Some of the grasses and the ag crops. So I'll give you an example here. What they're looking at, for some of these, the breeding cycle, in fact, is three times a year. So that will got it down for once every three years. So they're looking at three times a year. You can get a lot of information <laughs> in that period. And so, for example, if you look at their sweet sorghum, which they're looking at in Brazil, um, they're looking at generating about 20 oven dry metric tons per acre per year. I want to give you some context. The best in North America we're looking at for guys who are trying to do energy crops are Loblolly Pound, and they do two. And you guys don't do Loblolly Pound. So, interesting dynamics out here in terms of what's available. It's happening in real time. 
And essentially, if you look at where could we be going on this, look at again, we've got some history. Look at the folks did on corn. Where essentially what you saw is this dramatic improvement in bushels per acre. You know, when you went from open pollination to double crosses to single cross hybrids, and then to outright biotech where the crop guys are now, up to over 160 bushels per acre compared to that 20 they used to be at. And where's any energy crops right now? Just in the start with these double crosses. You can do so. This is just gives some examples of a sweet garden. You know, you're talking about, you know, this one month in one year, you're, you're, you're over eight feet on uh, a lot of biomass. Now, the question is, okay, you can do it technically, but will we actually do it? Well, I think we will, because in history again, look at the adoption, the precedent cross adoption, uh, precedent cross adoption curve that we've seen here. And, and what we see is, this is the years on the market and then the percent penetration. Various products, whether it be the black or the um, Roundup Ready soybean in Brazil, to Roundup Ready um, soybean in the U.S., to transgenic canola in Canada, insect resistant cotton in India, hybrid corn. You know, essentially, we do this fast. We really do the adoption fast. And it's independent, this time period is really independent of geography, where there's economic incentive. So, you know, again, for Iowa in 1930s, the hybrids, you know, a majority of acres are within six years. In Brazil, you know, very quickly. In Hawaii, a papaya, 98% of the growers did a particularly new seed in the first year. So we can move quickly if we want to. And just because we're not, other people are. Now, I'm going to just give you this example of the sweet sorghum, because, and this is where it's going to come first. And, and it's largely because you're taking advantage of the existing infrastructure. The typical corn, um, sugar cane in Brazil, essentially what you're doing is you can only grow it, you harvesting it for about 200 days a year. You've got your plant totally sitting idle in the rest. So what you do with sweet sorghum, essentially you plant it in November, you harvest it in March and April, you essentially add two months to the harvest season, and I got zero capital cost here. This is what's right to the bottom line of my cash flow. Fast scale up, raw production. This is, this is where you're going to see it coming faster. And that's going to be in the form of, it's going to be the, um, in that case, it's not even cellulosa business. It's still the sugar cane based on it. Well, not sugar cane, sugar based, but it's the sweet sorghum. Okay. If society has a reserve accounting system for hydrocarbons, why don't we have it for carbohydrates? I want to look at this. Push again this example we gave on sweet sorghum. Look at a 21 year contract. I can do 20 tons an acre, 100 gallons per ton, and essentially I'm producing about 1,000 barrels per acre of this. That's what I can do. Okay, how many acres do I need to be using this? Well, um, essentially, say, let's just throw out, you know, 10 million acres. That would give me about 10 billion barrels. Is that a lot, a little? Well, Exxon Mobil's total reserves are 11.7, BP 10.5, Chevron only 6.5. You have 10 million acres, you're a big player in terms of reserves. You're a big player. Can you do this? Put this into context. 10 million acres, a lot or a little. Well, global pasture land is about um, 8.2 billion acres. Global cropland, 3.4. Global wheat, 550 million. Typical farm in Iowa, 2,500. Well, you're, you know, you're a lot of farms in Iowa. Typical farm in Brazil, though, is 10,000. So is 10 million a lot or a little? It's a huge amount for a single company. Huge. Probably not doable. But in the big scheme of things, it's not a huge amount. Again, look at this Brazilian case study. You've got 18 million hectares in sugarcane. Those are acres, these are more hectares. 18 million hectares in sugarcane. 170 million in pasture for cattle, currently right now. And you know what? They are extremely inefficient in their cattle raising. But one head per hectare. One head per hectare. You can double this. A no brainer, quite frankly. It's just a little extra capital coming in, and they should. So, the ability 
once you provide a little more capital, to really increase the amount of free up pasture land, it's huge. You know, I just have to take 10% of that pasture land and I double my city base and try to reallocate it. So, the message I want to put out to you is that this whole thing of energy crop is serious. There's folks that are looking at this. But it has implications. It has implications why it requires land. Now, let's look at the land issue. The market for it. And I want to go back a little history and look at this block is the price of rice. This is the price of corn. The green is the price of wheat. And you know what this is? This is the number of media reports about land grabs. Prices went up, people wrote about it. Okay. Was it justified? Was it sensationalist media? Or was this a real issue? Well, in 2008, again, we did have a lot of land deals. And this is a busy now, but there were a lot. You know, you saw, for example, out of China, um, them do purchases of just over 2 billion hectares. The Japanese, 224. Out of Saudi Arabia, over 1 um, million. A lot of investments in different parts of the world. So there were a lot going on. And so there's a distributor report by the World Bank um, who has helped establish the fact. Again, the biggest plea that I can make or message to put out in all this is evidence based analysis. Go and actually look at the numbers and, and then draw your conclusions. So that's what they try to do is actually look at the numbers. And what they looked at is didn't that show that the demand for agricultural land did increase dramatically? It did. Pre-2008, the average um, farmland sales to around, or the average per year was about 4 million hectares per year. That was the average. Between 08 and 2010, it shot up to, the, the total was, four, was 45 million hectares. So there was a dramatic increase. There really was. And Africa was a target of about 70% of the year. What well, was also interesting, though, this isn't, wasn't just all the big, evil foreign investors. You know who did most of the investments? The local elite. They were, in fact, the guys writing most of the checks. Why? Not a big surprise. They know the situation. They see this increased scarcity, and they're the first to move. So it's not all about the big bad foreigner here. In total, sort of in developing countries, there's been about 230 million hectares of land, an area about the size of Western Europe. And those were, uh, I had gotten a decimal place earlier on the China stuff. So those were millions, not, not billions. Um, but about 230 million hectares of land has been sold at least since 2001. And, and if you look at the bulk of this now, it's been in the last few years, at least after COVID offset. I haven't been able to verify how they did it, but that's their suggestion. It's unlikely this agricultural land, though, um, that this demand for it is unlikely to slow. And in fact, some studies just say for biofuels, what we're talking about is as much as a conversion of 18 to almost 45 million hectares of land or biofuels by 2030. So, again, it's enough to move the dial here. Now, in response to this changes in demand, increasing demand, people have responded. Brazil is an example. And, and they said, well, a lot of this is foreign. So we're going to limit what foreigners can come in here and buy. Essentially, you put a size limit. And said, so if you're over that, you've got to have a local price. Well, that's one, okay, well, that's one response. But we've already said, it's not all about foreigners. To underscore that point is that I just point you to Saskatchewan. Did you know that the Canada Pension Plan and the Alberta Investment Management Corps are not allowed legally to own farmland in Saskatchewan? Two points. Um, so, it's, you know, we, we can be also kind of parochial sometimes. So, how much land is actually available? And this is the interesting part, I think, of this piece. And, and so what the, essentially the World Bank folks did, and working largely with the, also these people at the Yasla in, in Austria, is looked at what is the potential availability of uncultivated land in different regions. How did they define it? So this land that was not in agriculture, but could be, and it's important, with rain-based agriculture. No irrigation. Now, that's really important because one of the other moving variables, of course, is probably not going to have the water for a lot of this irrigation, or we might not be irrigated. So the issue is how much can we pull in and use it for, with just rain damage? And you get some interesting results. You get about almost 450 uh, million hectares that you've got out there. Second point is, where is it? A lot of land in Russia, and quite frankly, you can't use it. Why? It's way up. So you start looking at that. 
The monograph land in different regions, which is, say, within six hours travel time from a market. Essentially, you take only about 40% of it. But totally, where are we looking at? Where is this land available? Some key areas. The bulk of it, in fact, out of that 450 million, about 200 is in Sub-Saharan Africa, and about almost 125 in Latin America. And then you've got some in Eastern Europe, things like the Ukraine, Western Europe. But it's really that Sub-Saharan Latin America where you're seeing that land. Um, let's just sort of look at where the likelihood, the economics, attractiveness and burden is the greatest. And, and some of the, where it's most attractive to convert, in fact, is where you don't want it to convert it. It's often in places where there's rainfall. Now, this is a busy chart, but it's really interesting. Because it's looking at all of this land, different countries, on a couple of metrics. The first metric is what we call the yield gap. And this is with existing technology, what could we do to increase, how much could we increase our production simply by adopting existing technology in my area? So this is just information arbitrage. Not just new information technology existing. And, and, and so you see huge differences across countries. And then this looks like how much land is actually available. So where do you want to be? You want to be up in this quadrant here. Essentially where there's a huge yield gap and I got a lot of land. Right? That's where you want to be. Well, okay. The individual countries that tend to come up here are in Africa. Number of and some in Latin America. The green is Africa, the blue is Latin America. Where is North America and Western Europe? Going down here. We don't have a lot of the land and we're already in the Well, it's not really the right? You've already optimized it. We need the new technology to move that further. Now, I, what I will say is uh, it begs the question where there's a yield gap. Why is there a yield gap? Often there's very good reasons for it. Sometimes it's because, you know, again, I don't have the technology. I don't have the internal capability. I've got a lack of infrastructure. I may have a lack of capital markets, public institutions. I may have no property rights. So there's where's the incentive to do it? Whole series of reasons why you may not do it. But the reality is there's a big yield gap, which is that's that's good news. Does that suggest that I can expand my production here on the least on the food, both at the intensive and the extensive market. I don't necessarily just need the land. I can also do it in productivity. That's, a, that's a key. I'm not going to walk through these individual countries because I'm worried about time. I'm just going to give you two slides and concluding thoughts. The first is from society's perspective. And I would say the notion message here that the markets for food, fuel, and fiber are indeed converging. And that productive land for forestry and agriculture is going to be increasingly scarce. That's it. If you manage, it's probably going to be increasingly scarce. Okay, good. Second is, is that big productivity gains can be made both in agriculture and forestry by simply applying existing technology. It's been information arbitrary. Um, and new technologies like I just put out there with the sneak door and so forth, that's going to push the frontier all even better. The third is, is that these increasing demands, though, are going to we can expect them to trigger shifts in, in land use. And that has implications here, both from an environmental and social side. And we've got to manage those. We've got to understand that. We've got to manage how those are going, going to occur. Because there's going to be winners, winners and losers. And it's as critical as we look at this, it's really critical that we adopt a systems approach. It's important that we not look at this through a forestry side or an Alberta side. What's wrong? So those are some of the, from a societal perspective some of the observations. But you know what? They're all bankers. I look at it from an investment point of view. What are the implications there? First of all, I would say recognize up front that if an activity, any activity, is not environmentally sustainable, then it shouldn't be done. Period. Because it's not going to be a good investment opportunity. We don't want to get involved. It's not worth it. That's the first point that I'll make. Get that off the table. The second one, I think the potential financial returns from owning agricultural and timberland are significant. But the universe of sustainable investments is limited. You've got to do your homework. You really have to. The third is, is, is a social issue that I want to look at. And that is, before you go out and buy or lease land, always be aware that there's always someone who's already been on it. There's always. It may not be a lot, 
them was there someone who was used to you? So if you think you're an investor, you're going to fly into Khartoum, sign a deal with 100,000 hectares, and expect you to be successful, don't think so. First thing that's going to happen, you're going to find a lot of dirt in your job. That's exactly what happened. The local job they don't want you there. Why? Because it's important that you deal with the locals. And I would argue that it's not enough to be legally elected. You have to make sure that whoever was there is, you know, even if he hasn't been legally recognized, and comp- but, but you make sure that he's been at least compensated for this, and that if he's not been compensated, even if they've been customary users, you've got a problem. You really do. And you're ignoring it. And so the message here that I tell our investors um, is that if you want, that you really do want, um, it's not enough to have a legal agreement. You've got to have one that's also legitimate. And that if it's not a legitimate, then you're in risk of losing that over time. So that's just part of the cycle. And it's no different when you go offshore and say, so anyway, those are just some of the thoughts on what I think is a kind of fascinating issue. And, and I'm a guy who usually gets bogged down in, in the details of transactions. So this is a good chance for me to sort of think about that. So that's it. Um, 